Uh, I think for me it was the, the dust up there. I don't know what it is. They put the finest, nastiest dust on Army Post. And I couldn't sleep at all. My sinuses were just shut down. But, um, and, I, and then last night I woke up and I think I was just thinking about this. You know, I, I was thinking about um, where we're at as a church, you know, and I do, I think this is a building year and we're working towards purpose driven life. I think that's kind of the next. Um, goal kind of thrust uh, moving forward and uh, you know looking at ways to, to keep us centered and productive and one of the things that I thought would be a good transition is to look at some of Jesus parables you know he really he really speaks to us I mean he was speaking to them yes at that time you know in the first century but um, you know, the parables are great. They're like they're metaphors, and they do some great things for us. It's kind of like preaching. I said they're different kind of sermons, um, but there are some of them that they give us the big picture. You know, if you open up your GPS, you know, if you were to come to Illinois, never having been here, and you had to go to Rockford and Bloomington and St. Marion, you know, you, you get that big picture. You see, okay, it's going to be kind of a journey, you know, uh, north to south. Uh, but then as you get closer to where you need to be, you know, or um, to your destination, you know, you have to zoom in and get a little bit better idea of, of what the community is like, the layout, what are your main roads. And then, you know, you get to a point where it's turn by turn, you know, to, to your final destination. And, and looking at some of these um, some of these parables of Jesus, I think they're kind of they're kind of the local picture, you know. They might not tell you every step of the way, but they really tell you a little bit about where to live, where you're at. Um, so the parable that that struck me when I was preparing was the one of the workers in the vineyard. Um, so it's out of Matthew 20 and uh, runs verses 1 through 16. And I'm just going to read the the thing for us, the whole thing for us here, real quick. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for each day and sent them into, <clears throat> excuse me, and sent them into his vineyard. Now about the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go, work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. And when evening came, the, owners of the, vineyard said to his, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came, and each one received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us and have borne the bur who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered, <coughs> answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So he starts out, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. And I've talked about the kingdom of heaven before. There's this aspect of a now but not yet to the kingdom of God. When we think about the kingdom of God, oftentimes we think about that millennial kingdom. And that's the not yet part. That's when Jesus is going to come and, and usher in the age. Wh whether you believe it's going to be a 10,000 year reign of that sort or whether it's the institution of heaven and, and, and the fullness of its glory, um, whatever the case might be, that's the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. It's everything that's been claimed for Jesus. Everyone who's accepted him will be part of that kingdom. That's the not yet. But there's also a kingdom here and now. Each person who's accepted Jesus is part of that kingdom. And, and scripture refers to it several different ways. Uh, sometimes it talks about uh, people being basically like markers, you know, boundaries for the kingdom. Other times it talks about us being ambassadors, you know, for the king. So there's a, an aspect of now to this kingdom of God. And then there's the not yet, the one that we look forward to in the final age. Uh, it's that kingdom to come. But when we look at this parable, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. The landowner, when you really think about it, is God. That's absolutely how we should understand it. And if we want to understand it as the landowner being Jesus, that too is appropriate because they are one. And it says the kingdom is like a vineyard. And so you're going out 
these laborers are going out to do the work as a landowner. They're going out to pursue his interests. They're going out to serve his property. He may have grown up on that vineyard. He may have grown up tending that vineyard. And now they're going out to do his work. So within the parable, you see this landowner. You see these workers. You see, you see this place. But when you realize that we're talking about God and we're talking about his kingdom, and he's talking about us being called his workers, he's calling us to go about and do his work. And the interesting thing is within the parable, it doesn't tell us what specific work they're called to do. You know, we might imagine, I think most of us probably imagine something very specific. I imagined plucking grapes when I first read this. But when you really think about it, a vineyard, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and another thing to notice, too, is this is a 12-hour day. I want to point that one out. Um, he goes out in the first hour, but then it says he goes out again in the third, and the sixth, and the ninth, and then finally the eleventh. The work day for them would have been from um, basically, you know, probably an hour or two after sunrise to an hour or two before sunset. It's a long work day. You know, you get up, you do your household things, et cetera, et cetera. Then you go and you do work for the remainder of the day. And then you come back, do what you need to, to finish out your household duties and, and go to bed. But there's a lot that he's calling people to do. And, and when you just think about it, there's a number of things that are evoked. You know, there's, there's just the, the general things that happen with, you know, with a garden or with a, a vineyard. There's, there's probably pruning to be done. There's watering to be done. There's fertilizing to be done. Um, hopefully not the honey carts like they use in Amish country, but um, possibly. But those all correlate to something, you know, and, and it would have evoked these same things in people in the first century. When you think about pruning, and you think about what the harvest really is, when you're talking about the kingdom, the harvest is going to be people. Each of us needs pruning in our lives. Each of us carries things from our fleshy cells. Each of us carries baggage from the time before we were a Christian. And there are times where that needs to be pruned in order for us to then grow and flourish and bear fruit like we should. Or watering. Each person that comes into a church needs nurturing. We need that. And that's something that is offered within a church, is, is holding one another up in times of, of pain and, and trial and turmoil. Sometimes helping people to grow, just pointing them in the right direction. Um, all those sorts of things happen. And then uh, you look at the fertilizing. Well, it's, it's simply the feeding. And, and you can consider that as perhaps being rooted in the word and in firm biblical teaching, in truth. All those sorts of things. Another way you might look at it, and another image that it would evoke is, is just what is really needed for a plant to grow. Well, there's sun, there's soil, and there's water. And, and each of those things probably evokes something in us. When you think about the sun, think about that as the presence of God. Think about that. We need God in our own lives. And, and that's one of the images that's evoked. A church, the kingdom, it should be a place where you come to meet God. It's not a place where you come to meet Christians. It's a place where you come to meet God. And fortunately then, he gives us fellow Christians to have fellowship and to enjoy it with. But that's one sun. If you want to go with the pun, you can go with the sun is the sun. It's, it's the one that we meet at the foot of the cross. Uh, but there's also the soil. You know, you've got to be rooted. Rooted in the word. Rooted in God himself. You know, he's the, he's the creator, but he's also the sustainer of all creation. So there's that aspect of being rooted. And then again, water, there's that aspect of being nurtured. But when you really think about it, too, there's an element of being cleansed that comes with water. Uh, and it's something that you find in Scripture. And Think about your week. I had a long week. I don't know. Sometimes there's things that cling to me from the week, and I need to come in and experience the kingdom of God with my fellow Christians and let that be washed away. Just remember who he is and who I am. Take that Sabbath day. So all these things are evoked in this image of a vineyard. Of a landowner inviting laborers in to, to enjoy this prosperity, but also to work within this prosperity. And you realize that's God, and he's inviting us in. But all those things are maintenance. You know, if you've got vines, those are maintenance things. But what about expanding the vineyard? So there are other things that can happen. There's tilling. There's preparatory work. You've got to do the groundwork. Um, there's that other parable out there. You know the parable of the soils. Where there's rocky soil. And, it, you know, the rocky soil is the one where, you know, somebody hears the word, but they fall away because there's no root in them. 
the, and then there's also the path, the seed that falls along the path, and that's compacted soil, and that's soil where, uh, you know, it, it sits on the surface, and Satan just comes and immediately grabs it away. And then there's the, the soil that's that's choked with thorns. You know, the the seed is thrown upon it, and it starts to grow, but then as the thorns grow up, it, it chokes everything out. And those are the concerns of the world that, that keep people from truly coming to Christ. Honestly, the thorns are the convicting one for me. You know, um, that's the one where you look at it and like, oh yeah, I get worried about things and I'll let it keep me from God. Well, the thing is, when we start to apply this to the church, when we really think about it, there's tilling to be done in this world. Somebody tilled each of our hearts at some point. Think about what you were like as a child. Every child, really, they're, 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 isn't, like when they're, little, they're little narcissists, okay? <laughs> and our job, our job as parents, is to grow them up to a point where they're mature enough to receive the word. That's really the most important job that we have. Whether it's, it's you know, pulling some rocks out of that soil, or whether it's, it's helping them to, to learn to deal with some of the, the thorns, some of the concerns of the world that keep them from really receiving God, really coming into his presence, all those things. But the same is true for our adults around us, for neighbors around us. There are times where that kind word we speak, or, or that, that, uh, that gift that we give, or that thing that we do for them, plucks a rock out of that soil, or takes a concern away from them, to where when the time comes, when the seed's planted, it'll take root and grow. So there's tilling, there's preparatory work that happens in the vineyard, and then there's the planting. There's, there's actually sharing the word of the gospel. There's sharing that relationship, because you know what, sharing the word of the gospel isn't about just head knowledge. It's not about things that you believe. It's about the fact that there's a relationship to be had with the living God. And there's the harvest. It's when somebody comes to accept and that's the payoff. That's the thing that we celebrate the most. That's the new victory. And that's the payoff for the, for the, the landowner. That's the payoff for the workers, the harvest. Um, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Claiming new victories. And there's an interesting, uh, another one of the parables, basically, where it talks about uh, a new vine being grafted in. And the context of that is really talking about how Israel was, was considered the vine. You know, it's, it, God nurtured and grew them and they, they grew, but then they didn't serve the way they should. It was, it was a wild vine. You know, it didn't produce. Um, it didn't produce a harvest like it should. So instead, cut it down to the root and you take a new vine, a wild vine that will produce, and you can graft it in. And you can actually do that with a plant. You, you um, attach them to, to another root and there's a couple of ways you can do that and eventually they grow together. And that's what we are. As a church, we're part of that new vine. And it's another way that you work at growing a vineyard and, and, and bringing in a harvest. Um, but the idea there, and really what I want to get at is, the root isn't something that we do ourselves. Being rooted in God, that's Jesus. So that's what we're always about. We're always about bringing people and getting them rooted in Jesus, and then they can grow, because we can never get rooted in God ourselves. The reason being, we all have our own sin, and we'll never get there on our own. He's always going to be, be the bridge that, that gets us into the soil of the vineyard and allows us to flourish and bear fruit, whether it be fruit of the Spirit, whether it be, whether it be fruit in terms of, of going out and being laborers and bringing in more of the harvest, whatever the case might be. But this passage talks a bit about the wages, too. It says about the third hour he went out. So others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you <clears throat> whatever is right. So they went. And I actually um, pulled an article about what the denarius is, you know, what this, uh, what this was offered uh, to, to the first, uh, first laborers. And so the denarius was actually a Herodian coin. There were silver coins of the realm, basically, for the Roman Empire, and these were kind of the big coins. But, you know, they conquered a lot of regions, and each of those regions had their own coins that, that they were using prior to the Roman Empire, and some that they used afterwards. You almost think of it as, as pocket change. It's like the Roman Empire, those were the big bills, and, you know, all these little regions had their own coins. So the denarius basically was the accepted salary for a day's work at that time. So that 12-hour day that I talked about, that long day, that's why that was important, that was what a denarius was. So the first people were offered a denarius. It also happened to be the annual temple tax um, during the time when Jesus was ministering. But the landowner says, I will pay you whatever is right. 
You notice when he comes to this, uh, this other group, he doesn't tell them it's going to be a denarius. He tells them, I'll pay you what was right. He didn't specify. He, he basically relied on his reputation. You know, if you think about it, if you're standing at the gateway, and that's where they would have been, and at that time, if, if you needed work, you would go to the gate of the city and you would stand there and wait for an employer to come around and put you to work. And if you're standing at the gateway and somebody comes up and says, well, I'll pay you whatever is right. Now, if you don't trust them, if you don't have a good reputation, who, who's going to follow along and do your work? Uh, so obviously, the, the landowner is a man of good reputation, uh, reputation for fairness, perhaps even generosity. Now, the, the thing that this reminded me of was when I was growing up, um, I did the whole walking beans and all, they don't hardly do that anymore. They spray everything. But um, so when I was 13, 14, uh, they had a, a job core thing and you could basically go to the town square and hang out there and eventually you get picked up to go out on a bean crew and you'd work in the fields. And did that for a year or two, got pretty good at it, and a buddy of mine and I, we started contracting ourselves instead of doing this job core thing. You'd go out and, um, you yeah, know, sometimes we'd call people, whatever the case would be, we'd take a contract. So many acres, we'll do it for this number of dollars. Made pretty good money that way. Uh, until one day, we came in contact, I think his name was Herman Stortenbecker. I, I don't want to, <laughs> I shouldn't talk ill about somebody, but um, in Iowa, so. Um, so we went out with Herman, we saw this field, you know, we looked at it, he told us how many acres it was, we agreed upon a price, I think it was like $500 or something like that. And we went out and for the first three hours of the day, we worked and worked and worked and, you know, got, got all the weeds out of the, all this stuff closest to the road and as we come up over a rise, we see the rest of the field. Buttonweed, cockaburr, sunflower, everything that you can imagine, thick as could be. And so Brent my friend and I, uh, we talked about it for about 15 minutes, and we went back to his truck, hopped in, drove over to Mr. Stortenbecker's farm, and told him, you know what, you just got three hours free labor from us. Went on our way. Um, and then we found out afterwards, so this man does not have a good reputation. And you know what I found out later was he struggled to have laborers for his farm. He owned all this land, but because he had a poor reputation, he struggled. So this landowner has a good reputation. That makes sense when you realize the landowner is God. He's the creator. If he promises to pay you what's fair, is it going to be fair? This is the God of loving kindness. This is the God who's taking care of his people throughout all generations. And so he invites people to work in his vineyard. So it talks a, a little bit more about the laborers. You know, we know about, a bit about the first ones, but it says he went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Well, because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. So here they are standing at the gateway, the gate to the town. And each of them, they're taken at different times. And this is probably according to their circumstances. You know, some of them may not have arrived until later. <clears throat> Perhaps they had their own land to work. And then when it was time, they, they needed to supplement that income. It doesn't really tell us. But there was always somebody there, always somebody in need of, a, of an employer. And the thing that we can take away is that basically what God says is, I have need and you're willing. I'll take you. No matter what the time is, if I find you at the gate, I'm going to take you. And we also can learn from this parable, there are always people looking. You know, we can think of it as looking for work, yes, looking to, to be a laborer. Um, but really, what does that mean? You know, everybody's seeking something to put their hand to. You know, they would want to put their hand to the plow at something. Everybody needs meaning in their life. Everybody needs purpose. They need something to work for. People are standing at the gate. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people that are standing at the gate and they're wanting to do other things and they'll grab whatever else comes their way. There are some that will grab anything except for what the kingdom has to offer. Spiritually speaking, there are some that want to work in a comfortable office with air conditioning and, you know, um, but they're not willing to work in the vineyard. They're not willing to put their hand to the plow and work for the kingdom. That's always going to be true as well, but there's always somebody standing at the gate. And there are some that are just waiting for that invitation, like those in the 11th hour. No one called us. There's always somebody waiting. There's always somebody willing. I think sometimes, you know, when we talk about the wages too, sometimes that's what we focus on. Uh, uh, I can't say too much. When you think about what the wages really are in here, when you think about the fact that, okay, 
this is God. He's asking you to work in his vineyard. If you accept, he's, he's offering a denarius. That denarius, really, what it represents is eternal life. So in a certain respect, there is absolutely no way that we can focus too much on that because that is the greatest gift possible. But there are times where I think we forget to tell people that if you accept that invitation into, into the vineyard, there's work to be done. And that's what discipleship is. You know, putting your hand to the same work that the landowner does. And sometimes people are a little bit shocked that the life of faith involves a little bit of struggle, involves a little bit of work. But he keeps calling laborers. And it goes on and says, When evening came, the owners of the vineyard said to his the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers, pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. So I think sometimes it, Certainly here, there were expectations. There were expectations. If you've been at it longer, you'll receive something more than those who, who come late. Um, and, and there's actually horizons of interpretation. And by that I mean, it depends on the audience who hears this. The original hearers would have been Jewish. And they would have been hearing a Jewish speaker. They would have been hearing Jesus, who was a Jewish speaker. They probably would have interpreted this as being um, something about those who are devout throughout their lives versus those who are not devout and, and came to a real devotion to their Jewish faith later in life. You know, you look at the, the Jews and Gentiles then of the first century, hearing it as a church, they might have been hearing it about that as about that separation between Jews and Gentiles. They might have said, oh, okay, the first workers, the ones that are grumbling, those were the Jews, but we've come under this new covenant, and we're the ones that come with joy in our hearts. But now for us, you know, so separated from that, you know, we can hear that and recognize that it's in some ways about somebody who comes early in life to Jesus versus somebody who comes late in life to Jesus. And this parable is challenging. It says that we receive the same wages. It doesn't matter who we are. We receive the same wages, but the wages are eternal life. Now, don't hear me wrong either. Believe me, there are benefits to receiving earlier rather than later. When you think about it, if you've received that gift of eternal life early in your life, you've got security. It's a lifetime of security. Whereas somebody who comes later in life, they have, have dealt with all of that insecurity, all of the, the uncertainty that life has to offer until the time that they finally accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you accept early in life, you have opportunities to do more things, to earn more crowns for Jesus' glory. So it says, when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Let me tell you what they were focused on. They were focused on the burden of the work and the heat of the day. They weren't thinking about what they were earning. They weren't thinking about what they were building. They weren't thinking about the vineyard. How do you feel about work? That's a question that, that it, it begs of each of us. How do you feel about the work? I'm not going to lie. There are times where I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing some kingdom work, and I'm thinking too much about the burden and not about what's being built. Do you consider what you receive as a blessing, or do you try and compare it to others? Sometimes we focus too much on others and what they're receiving in this life as opposed to what we've received. And the fact is we've received something very good. And then the question is, is this fair? Is it fair to question the landowner about what he gives you? You know, the day's wage, that's salvation. And when you think about that, expecting more, it's like asking this landowner to multiply infinity. It simply doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. Yet when you know the landowner's God, you realize he actually does give more. What have you received in this life? That security. Uh, all those things that, all those blessings that you've received as a Christian. But not only that, he gives an answer. The landowner gives an answer. God gives an answer. He says, but he answered one of them. Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? He starts out by saying, I'm not being unfair. He makes a statement. I am not being unfair. 
You know what? That's an understatement. God is showing mercy by inviting anyone into his vineyard under any circumstance. That is God's mercy. So whatever he chooses to pay, he's not being unfair. And then he goes on to ask some questions. Didn't you agree? He said, didn't you agree to these wages? When you think about it, when you first became a Christian, what did you agree to? How did that feel? Was it gratitude? Was it relief? Was it joy? All of those things. So why would it feel different later? Because all those things are still offered. You're still getting the fair wage. That's convicting because I think each of us has probably had that where our faith and the joy we take in it, all those emotions, they kind of wax and they wane. Uh, all of those things. But didn't you agree? It's a call to remember what it was like when you were first saved. And it goes on and says, don't I have a right? Don't I have the right? I think that might be a gentle reminder. He would have been right if he hadn't offered. Um, you know, giving a day's wages regardless of when you come. It's mercy and grace, whether you came early or late. Are you envious that I am generous? In reality, the kingdom of heaven is defined by generosity. Even though it's a call to work, it's defined by generosity. We serve a gracious king. He has a vineyard, and he's still looking for workers. And you know, it's not even close to the 11th hour. So finally, there's a consequence. There's a result of all of this. He says, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. And I mentioned all those horizons of interpretation, whether it might be you know, Jews versus Gentiles, which one's first, which is last, early or late, all those things. But really, the reality of it is, it, reality of it is none of that's important. It's that attitude at the very end. Those who work and receive with gratitude, if that security comes early or late in their life, will be first over those who grumble over the life of security that they've been given. God desires a heart of gratitude. It doesn't matter when you receive. He desires a heart of gratitude. And he's got work for each of us to do. And it's a wonderful thing. Because he's asking us to build a vineyard. We get to be a part of that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank, th thank you that you spoke so deeply. That the words that you spoke 2,000 years ago resonate today. That just as, as those people, those hearers of the word then, were invited to put themselves within the story, so are we. And I pray that we enter into your service each day with gratitude. And Lord God, we recognize there are days where we can't work in the, in the sense that perhaps we think. Where uh, sometimes the brokenness of this life, the hurts that we have, keep us from, from putting our hand to the plow. But the truth is we can lift up our voice. We can always pray to you. Lord God, we can always invite you into the circumstances around us. We can lift up those who have, uh, have hurts that, that live in the neighborhoods next to us, that, the family members who don't know you. Lord God, we can find a place of purpose and fruitfulness in your kingdom. Something to put our hand to. We are able to get up each morning, Lord God, and we can take joy in that work. We thank you for that. Lord God, we pray that we ourselves would be deeply rooted, deeply rooted in you as Lord, as Savior, as living God, as creator and sustainer of all. And Lord God, we pray that we'd be nurtured in your presence, that Lord God, there be a season of harvest for our church, that there be a harvest in abundance, a harvest of fruits of the Spirit, a harvest in people, of those saved, a harvest of, of great joy where we can come and celebrate in your presence. Lord God, we thank you that you once saw us standing at the gate and you invited us to come in. Lord God, we come to you with the utmost of gratitude. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.